All right, everybody, welcome to, um, welcome. I just wanted to give a minute um, so everyone can get logged in, but it looks like we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, my name is Tara Lee, and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator for Writer's Block Bookstore with locations in Winter Park and Winter Garden, Florida. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we want this to be an engaging and informative event for you. So please, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A box below and we'll make sure to get to as many of, them as many of them as we can towards the end of the session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. Our featured author this evening is Brenda Peinado. Her first collection just came out today and is titled The Rock Eaters. And we were so excited to hear all about this creative and very timely collection of short stories. Brenda is a Dominican American author of fiction, nonfiction, and screenplays. Her stories have received numerous awards and honors, including an O. Henry Award, a Pushcart Prize, the Chicago Tribune's Nelson Algren Literary Award, and a Dana Award. Her fiction has appeared in more than 40 journals and newspapers. Um, she received her bachelor's in computer science from Wellesley College and worked in IT as an auditor before pivoting and returning to school and graduating with her master's in fiction from Florida State University. She went on to earn her PhD in fiction from the University of Cincinnati, where she taught screenwriting, fiction, science fiction, and fantasy writing. She currently teaches fiction and screenwriting at the University of Central Florida's BA and MFA programs. Joining Brenda in conversation this evening is Kimberly King Parsons. Kimberly's debut collection of short stories titled Black Light was released in 2019 and received critical acclaim and numerous accolades. Among other recognitions, it was long, long listed by, for both the 2019 National Book Award and the Story Prize, and was also a finalist for the 2020 Edmund White Award for debut fiction. Born in Lubbock, Texas, Kimberly earned her bachelor's in, of English and, and master's in literary, literary studies from the University of Texas before moving to New York where she earned her master's in fiction from the, the Columbia University. Her book reviews, interviews, and fiction have garnered high praise and have appeared in numerous publications. Wow, where do we go from there? There's so many amazing accomplishments for both of you. I wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to our panelists and we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Congratulations, Brenda. Um, it's so nice to see you here and thanks so much. I see all sorts of friendly um, faces or not faces, but names in the chat. Um, I think the first thing that I think we should do is you should read a little bit of the Rock Eaters for us, um, whatever you want, just to kick us off so we can hear your beautiful stories, a little bit of them. Yeah, well, thank you to Writer's Block for hosting this. Um, I've been to uh, quite a few launches at Writer's Block over the years. Jamie who, Poissant, who's in here, um, and Jake Wolf. Um, and thank you so much, um, Kimberly, for hosting this um, and doing the Q&A with me. I have Blacklight, um, which is, oh, can you see it? There we go, <laughs> Blacklight, <laughs> which is Kim's collection of stories um, that I have loved since my editor sent them to me. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, so I guess to kick us off um, for everybody here and thank you to you all for coming to hear me have this conversation and hear a little bit of the Rock Eaters. Um, I am so excited to share the first few pages of the first story, which is called Thoughts and Prayers. The morning before the school shooting passed like any other. All my neighbors out at dawn performing oblations to the angels on our roofs. Families clustered around the sidewalks, mist from our lawns, swirling around our ankles, looking up at the angels' pale humanoid faces and downy bird bodies perched beside our chimneys. Our mothers beat their breasts, performing sorrow for the tragedies that always went on elsewhere in the world. Our parents yelled their usual thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, toward the angels atop our roofs. As children, we were supposed to kneel in the moist grass and be quiet in case the angels were ever to speak. The angels, for the most part, barely noticed. They chewed their cud from the grasses and bugs they scavenged during the night and then shat runny white on our roofs, the shingles looking iced with snow despite the Florida heat. When I was in kindergarten, we'd throw rocks at them to get their attention, 
but they just turned and resumed their silent watch over the neighborhood. My parents began the ritual already dressed in their work clothes, looking as polished as a photograph in front of our freshly painted stucco house. I was obedient in my stiff school clothes. My mother never allowed me to stumble outside in my pajamas like some of the other kids. There was no greater argument in our house than when my mother thought I had done something unworthy of our angel. Out of all the angels, ours was considered the most blessed of the neighborhood. When my parents came to this country after college, this house was the first one they looked at, and their immigration papers arrived miraculously within the week. While others searched for homes and jobs for months, my parents sailed into their new life, prayed gratefully to their new rooftop patron. When the economic downturn came and brought with it a plague of layoffs, my mother was able to keep her tech job, and my father flourished in a financial field that boomed in downturns, betting on failure, he called it. The hurricane tore apart most roofs in our Florida suburb, but not mine. Every day, my mother returned to the house, pulling into our drive. She breathed a great sigh as she saw our angel perched beside our chimney, albino-faced, sleek-winged, dumb eyes that looked at nothing. At our basketball games, the parents cheered for us, but it was known that the real game was played silently among the angels. Across the street, my best friend Rima Patil's family kneeled in front of their ramshackle house, the embarrassment of the neighborhood, mold blooming on the stucco, brown waves along the roof line where the gutters and wooden fascia had fallen into disrepair. A bright blue tarp over the roof above Rima's room where a hurricane had downed a tree, just barely missing their angel. The blue tarp rolled and snapped like a flag of shame. Rima's family was known to have the worst angel on the block. Her dad was one of the first to get laid off, lose health insurance. Her older brother had developed schizophrenia and claimed that the angels gave him secret messages. The family didn't have the money for his medications. The bank had visited their house three times in the past month. When the hurricane hit, the oak tree in front of their yard not only punched a hole in the roof, but also fell onto the family car. The tarp they placed over it leaked mist and bugs and occasional angel guano. That they were the one Hindu family in a neighborhood of Latino Catholics was not lost on my mother, though the fact that they were even darker than the rest of us, my mother pretended not to notice. Rima was wild, a force of nature, and my mother was known to count this as one of Rima's mother's misfortunes. Nothing terrible had happened to Rima's sister, Shruti, yet. She was valedictorian, a national prize cellist, radiated beauty, but we were all waiting. There was a sense that she would not be spared. It was Shruti Rima got her strength from, though while Rima's came out in recklessness and force, all elbows and knees, her sister had merged it with a softness that came out in glory when she played music. I idolized Shruti for her ability to walk the line between strength and obedience, her ability to get away with doing whatever she wanted while still looking like a saint, unlike Rima, who fooled no one, and me, feeling caged and wanting desperately to do something unforgivable. Rima winked at me and then resumed solemnity, leaning on her fists in their overgrown grass. Her long black braid flicked with the impatience of a cat's tail as she turned back, echoing how it often weaponized into a whip on the basketball court. Her sister, Shruti, inclined her head as if she were still at her cello, her own long black hair draping over one shoulder. I knew Shruti had woven Rima's braid, had raked her deft fingers through the silken mess, had crooned a carnatic composition as she worked. For the moment, Rima's lanky brother, Rajiv, was quiet, his eyes sallow from sleeplessness instead of his usual energy. Their mother beat her breast with one hand and kept her other hand dug into Rajiv's elbow in case he started one of his outbursts. Their father, still in his pajamas, gritted his teeth and barked thoughts and prayers like it was being dragged out of him. Back in Bengaluru, they'd had other words, other rituals for the angels on the roofs. The angels above us looked on into the distance, snapping their mouths to eat mosquitoes from the air. Sunrise bled hot over the roofs like a punctured yoke another day given to us. How could I have known that this would be the last time I would see all of them together, that unlucky family? And if I had known, what would I have done to protect them? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad that you read 
thoughts and prayers. It's a perfect example of um, the first thing I want to talk about, which is something that I think the thing that struck me the most about the Rock Eaters was this really effortless ability to sort of layer all of these things um, simultaneously. So in, this is a perfect example. There's these humanoid angels on the roofs, but then there's also talk of layoffs and losing insurance and um, later gun control issues and the sort of mixing of this fantastical elements and then real life stuff, like situational stuff. And I'm wondering, do you start with when you're writing these stories, when you're writing these stories in general, do you start with one layer first and then sort of add it on? Or do they sort of come together organically where you're thinking that, of course, these angels are gonna be tied to this issue with gun control, like which, which comes first? I think it depends on the story. Um... There, there's one story in the collection, uh, The Stones of Sorrow Lake, that uh, that story started out as a realist story. Um, and I kept adding plot to it. Um, I wanted, I spent a summer with a boyfriend in upstate New York, um, sort of visiting his town and his family. And I was always really impressed with the way they, it was such a small town and they knew everybody's legacy. So everyone knew how each other's grandfathers had died and how their grandmother, the recipes of their grandmothers. And I was, it's something that I really missed being a, a child of immigrants, just having that like long line of succession just surrounding you all the time. Um, and I kept wanting to write about that. And I just started adding plot that didn't work and kept taking me away from what I wanted to talk about until I came on to the image of these stone, these sorrow stones that physically manifested that legacy of, of their sorrows. So that one was definitely one where it came as a layer. Um, and then thoughts and prayers, I started out with um, the angels and the school shooting um, because it always struck me. I mean, we've had so many shootings um, and, and especially as a teacher, school shootings is something that's sort of always on our mind, um, especially when you think about, you know, what will we have to do to defend one student in our class? Or um, we had lots of training um, of if a school shooting happens, this is how you lock the doors and this is how you shield your body and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, use your belt to like tie the doorknobs. And so after uh, a few years of that training, every time I started a job, I started thinking about, you know, when people say like thoughts and prayers are with, you know, the family of whoever and how inept that seemed, um, how not enough that seemed. So I had this image of these, these angels that were sort of the manifestation of this thoughts and prayers. But with that one, the um, Instagram prayer group that sort of descends on the town, um, the mothers that are sort of going on a school shooting tour of prayer, um, that didn't come until after. Um, when I was thinking about like, okay, I've got the school shooting. Um, where do I go from here to sort of talk about this girl and her feeling and her sort of exploring what it means to protect someone and wanting to be protected? Well, when you, when you think about these, the way you're adding all of those layers in, it's really, um, it's really, they're magical leaps. Like there's, there's leaps all over the place. Like whether it's a leap in the sort of the logic of the story or the, there's like an actual magic, something that's magic that happens. But I'm wondering, you know, that's an act of bravery to sort of be able to put those things in. Seeing the, the image of the rocks on the lake and being like, that's perfect for this story. That it, what's so fascinating to me is that the stories are so real. The elements that are realist are not given short shift by, by putting in these fantastical elements. So it's so fascinating to me how you do both at the same time. But all of that is about those leaps, uh, whether it's in form or structure, those are risks that you're taking with all of that, with all of that writing. And I'm wondering if you set out to take risks in your short fiction, or have you always just been this brave with your writing? Or is it something that you sort of had to learn to do over time? Thank you. That's, that's <laughs> such a kind way of putting it. Um, I would put it as I'm very easily bored um, and I'm impatient. Um, so I was telling somebody else that I, um, I don't love scene, um, but I do love detail and I love uh, sort of moving through a story like, like jet propulsion rather than sort of a, a slow look at things. Although 
I do love stories that are sort of slow boils. Um, but as a writer, I often want to sort of take off running. And so for me, the leaps are that way of sort of that, that rocket fuel that sort of gets the story going um, quickly and sort of explosively. Well, I wonder, I read an interview with you that said that you moved around a lot as a young person. Um, and I wonder, like I am someone who for better or worse grew up in the same area for, until I was like an adult and then eventually left home. But so home for me is sort of a representation of claustrophobia or feeling sort of tethered to a place. But I wonder if for you, all of that moving around or that sort of momentum um, impacts your work in any way. Yeah, so I grew up in, in Tampa for um, a while, but we did often go to the Dominican Republic for the summer. Um, we, I, and then I think from the time I was 16 on, I sort of had a new place that I was living every year uh, as a like young adult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it definitely gave me a lot of perspective on just how different worlds can appear if you just you know, not just take a short plane ride, but, you know, blink your eyes and think about things differently or use a different language to describe the exact same thing. And suddenly everything feels different. Um, so I think that's definitely one reason why I wrote a collection first and the novel is giving me trouble. And even the novel that I'm writing now is, um, has like many timelines and different perspectives um, is just that it's, it's so hard for me to stick to one reality because that doesn't feel true. Um, and so I love the way that short story collections can sort of give you sort of like the, the multifacet of a jewel where you can look at it a million different ways and it's, it's maybe getting to the same heart, but everything feels so different every, every new story. Yeah, and one of the things that I noticed, obviously, a lot of these stories were published previously, uh, or not a lot of them, but some of them were published already, and you um, put this together as a collection. I'm wondering how the process of actually collecting the stories and putting them together, and whether that's arranging them or things that got cut when you were putting the Rock Eaters together, um, what was that process like? Uh, that process you would probably be familiar with because we both share a brilliant editor, Margaret yeah. Wiseman, who um, my agent helped me put together uh, the sort of stories that we were going to go out with. Um, and I had published maybe 40 or 50 stories at that point. And it was just a process of thinking about which ones felt, because you can definitely see a progression in my work from um, when I first started my MFA, most of those were realist stories and uh, some of them were about IT auditors um, and a lot of them were about young adult, like the way I was at that moment. And it was only as I grew as a writer that I started sort of expanding um, into what felt right for me and what I really loved. So she helped me sort of um, figure that out with the collection that we were going to approach editors with. And then Margot, um, I would call her a drill sergeant, except that she's so sweet, but <laughs> she really beat those stories into shape um, and really thought about what order they should go in. And uh, I have been so stunned with how she's able to look at a story and see the heart of it and her edits all sort of bring you back to the heart of the story. So I've, I've been really lucky. She's magic. And she also, I think what Margot did for me was take these stories that um, some of them had been published before, had been edited by other you know, editors or journals. And she was sort of like, but think of it as a book. Like this is a separate thing now. These aren't just stories that we're putting together side by side, but so how do we make this sort of, um, I think we talked about it like a mixtape or like, how do you, how do you sort of plot this out and, and break hearts with it, you know? How do you make, how do you win people over with it? Um, and yeah, she's magical and wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I, it's interesting that you're talking about moving around a lot as a young adult, um, because I love, I love both reading and writing stories about, and novels about teenagers um, and young people. And you have a few stories that are sort of focused on young people or putting um, teenagers at the center. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what it is that appeals to you about writing about those sort of younger voices. Yeah, I, I really like writing about uh, from the perspective of girlhood and children um, because it's, 
I'm so bewildered often by the world and by people um, and how much what people do in the world that can come from love ends up being, you know, twisted or cause harm along the way, even when it, it comes from a really good place. And I think children are so good at noticing that um, and, and being angry <laughs> about it. I think a lot of times as adults, um, everything is muted. We're very distracted. Um, we have a million different things and jobs. Um, and often when I talk about jobs, it's, it's usually adults. Um, but when it comes to looking at people's, at why the world and love is the way it is, um, it's just so interesting to me the way that, that young children can say, I know that you love me, mom and dad, but why are you doing this? Or you know, I know that this world is this magical, wondrous place and look at this really magical, horrific thing. Um, so I, I do enjoy using children to talk about that. But then also there's something about girlhood and the relationships between girls with each other mm -hmm. um, that I think is really interesting. There's such a mix of, you know, we're so smart and can use it so devastatingly um, and can be so cruel and so kind. And there's like love mixed in with all of it. Um, and so I'm really interested in relationships between girls that, you know, maybe they're similar or they could have loved each other in a different life, but instead there's this really like frenemy ship that's going on at the heart of it. Yeah. And well, you write about that too. I do. Well, and I, I was thinking about the story, the whitest girl um, in the rock eaters and this, I, what I love that you do so well too, is this idea of I, you start a story and I think I know who the other is. And then suddenly the other turns or there's like an other, other, if that makes sense. Um, so this idea of like sort of decentering and I love um, the, the we narrator is also something that I feel goes along. It makes me think of girlhood or it makes me think of that sort of the clickish thing that can happen sometimes with teenagers um, where it's a sort of almost a collective that comes out and you use the we narrator in a few different places. Um, and it can heighten a sense of belonging, but it also can, can sort of, um, can sort of contrast with that as well. I wonder what your thoughts are about using, do you, I mean, I love reading We Narrators. I think that's so fascinating, but um, what is it that appeals to you about using that type of narrator? It's a really good way of um, shortcutting to a different kind of nuance. Um, when you talk about the individual, you're dealing a lot with the psychology of, of one person and that's a, definitely a kind of nuance and complexity. Um, but if you're talking about larger issues that you want to sort of look at the nuances of a group that we narrator allows you to sort of dip into all of these characters without having to stay too long and you end up getting this really rich complex group um, because you're not having to focus on individuals too much but there's also such a dreaminess of um, of of talking from speaking from a collective point of view and I think a lot of the stories that are we narrators, it's, it's kind of like you're in a dream um, and you're trying to get out of it um, the way that you do when you're in a dream and you're like, what, what is happening? And you're like, maybe I can wake up. Um, and they're constantly trying to, to, they have this like bewilderment of the dream that's happening in front of them. Um, and I think usually at the end of those stories is that coming to terms with, um, wanting to wake up from it or being sort of assimilated into that that dream life for sure yeah but i wonder when you're talking about nuance one thing that something that strikes me about your stories also is that they're so for lack of a better word just big like there's so much happening in these stories and a lot of people tend to think of short stories as being minute gestures or the sort of narrowing down of idea. And for me, your stories are so expansive and huge. Um, and I wondered, it's sort of like, how do you do it? Who gave you the right to do that, Brenda? But you do, you do it so well. And I wonder if you were always encouraged because I feel like sometimes people say for short fiction, stay in your lane or do it, do it this way, or you can only have um, smaller, smaller relationships or smaller gestures. And you're, you're not afraid to go really big in your stories. Um, and then after you answer this question, I want to talk to you about the difference between that and then doing a novel when you have a lot more space to do, to do that stuff in. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I would say I had really great teachers um, that sometimes discouraged the, the kind of thing that I wanted to do, but they each of them gave me sort of a different way of looking at stories. Um, and I had a lot that were very focused on plot. So Leah Stewart and Mark Weingartner were very um, plot focused and they sort of gave me a lot of how to write these big, expansive, complicated plot things. Um, but I think a lot of it was when I was young, reading the sort of Latino boom magical realists like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and um, Isabel Allende, where they write, I mean, generations worth of material political scenes that are the size of countries. Um, Salman Rushdie has, um, his Midnight's Children is one of my favorite books and it does the same thing. So I think a lot of what I read um, sort of gave me that uh, feeling of what could be possible in stories. And then I also have to shout out to my husband, Micah Hicks, um, who he has been my cheerleader since we met in graduate school, we were best friends. And he was the one who, you know, I, I had these like crazy stories that didn't quite work. And I had a lot of friends who were like, yeah, this doesn't work. Stop doing that. It doesn't work. And Micah was like, it doesn't work yet, but keep doing this. This is so exciting. And I love it. Um, and he, he also writes magical realism. So I think a lot of um, my permission giving has been that I've had such a good cheerleader on the side. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like that's the, a lot of times for me when I'm reading a book like this and it seems like there's so much authority and you, I ask myself as a writer, how do they, like, how do they, how can they just do that? How can they just add this in or how can they take that leap? And it's like, you just do it. You just take the leap and then your reader will follow. But so right now you're working on a novel. And so your short stories are already very expansive and you do so much in a short space. Do you find, you were saying the novel's giving you trouble um, or, you know, it has its own problems. But I wonder what, uh, what how do you feel the differences between writing short fiction and, and the novel? And were you working on the novel all along or have you, did you sort of switch over? Yeah, I had been working on the novel all along. So in a lot of ways, uh, the stories in this collection can be sort of, you know, affairs <laughs> from, from the novel marriage. Um, I, um, the novel, I think in my case, um, I'm able to look at something and have a lot more to say about it. So I think you can give people these, these brief dreams and short stories that are amazing and you can do so much with it. Um, but oftentimes you have to keep it to, you know, one specific thing that you're looking at and keep, keep the answer to the question small. Whereas if I ask something like what violence is necessary to make the world a better place in a story like Thoughts and Prayers, it's one very small neighborhood over the course of a few days with, you know, this face off between these two families um, and this Instagram prayer group in a novel when I ask that, and, and that is what I'm looking at in this novel. Um, it's a civil war with, you know, that spans countries and suddenly I have a ca cast of characters that are, you know, eight deep. And unfortunately, also the, the main character can see all possible timelines and she's trying to save her mother, which has also multiplied what can happen because suddenly there's, you know, an infinite number of versions of herself. Oh, that's I, so good. It I amazing. won't do that again, though. <laughs> that's what's <laughs> giving me trouble. <laughs> Well, I want to take, I think that we want to take some questions from the people here, but I wanted to ask you one last thing before that. So you're saying that you're not going to do that again in a novel. Was there, were there any stories um, or a particular story in the Rock Eaters that you found particularly challenging to finish um, or one that came really easily? I, I feel like both of those stories are always kind of fun to hear about. Yeah. Okay. So I would say the one that gave me the hardest, the, the most trouble was the Stones of Sorrow Lake. I rewrote that story maybe eight times from scratch before the idea for the stones came through. Um, and the one that gave me the most existential difficulty maybe was um, We Work in Miraculous Cages was a story where 
it came a lot inspired from real life. So the main character is a, um, she's a front desk person at both a hair salon and a, vet, a veterinarian clinic, um, which I was. And I did these minimum wage jobs at a time right after my MFA when I had gotten some publications, but I sort of, I, I had quit my job in tech um, and I didn't really feel like I could go back. And I was doing these minimum wage jobs and just felt like I am never going to be a writer. And I was working like I had four hours a night to sleep. I went from one job to the other and everything just felt so hopeless. And I had been on my feet for like 18 hours at one day. And I just remember my feet hurting and being like, I am never going to be a writer. And just like kind of collapsing on the floor and being like, I can't walk anymore. My feet hurt too much. And just that feeling, writing that story was this feeling of hopelessness, but then also that like desperate hope that I had where I was like, if I don't, if I don't write in these five minutes that I'm like collapsed on the floor, I'm always going to have that decision to make and I'm never going to make it. Um, so that particular like period of time, I ended up writing for like five minutes on my phone between jobs. Um, and I wrote a surprising amount when I was writing that, but I wanted that. So that story has sort of everything distilled in there that was both like that feeling of hopelessness, but also that like hope at the end that it's like, no, we can do this. Um, and I'm glad I stuck through it. And then my narrator that, yeah, I would say that story is the existentially difficult one. Um, for the easy ones, there were quite a few stories that sort of came out all in one go. Um, the Great Escape was like that. Um, Piacciani ended up uh, locking herself away to great escalation all in the course of one afternoon for me. And um, the other one that sort of came out all in one go was The Kite Maker, the alien story. Wow. Um, it's one of the longer stories, but- I know, I'm like, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I pulled an all-nighter for that one, but it, it sort of came from that first image of these aliens flying kites in a park, and the rest of the story just came, just flowed after that. Wow. Well, also, when I, I'm so in awe of your, just how prolific you are. You're saying you had 40 stories, and you're sort of picking down to narrow down to pick which ones went to the book, and I'm just so, so impressed, but also, I feel like those hard stories sort of pave the way for the easy stories so even though sometimes it's you know it feels impossible um maybe they're maybe it sort of averages out to something um that's awesome okay so i guess now i wonder um hi you want to take some questions sure okay um let's see here we have from gisella would like to know where does the name rock eaters come from so the Rock Eaters is the title of one of the stories in the collection. Um, and it is about a group of flying prodigals who return to their island country. Um, and their kids can't fly yet. It's sort of something that happens in puberty. And the children end up eating rocks um, because they don't want to fly for reasons that um, you should, you can read the story. But um, it's kind of a, about a generational divide between these, these flying prodigals and their, um, their children that they find infuriating, their, their rock eaters. Um, so for me, that seemed like the perfect title for the book because the book is so much about um, loving across divides, loving across boundaries, um, wanting to feel rooted in a place and yet having this legacy of, of being weightless and flying. Um, that to me, all of, all of the characters in this book seemed like they had that in their heart. They were rock eaters. Oh, okay, very interesting. Um, next question from Bobby Marquis. He said, I'm looking forward to reading your um, reading these stories. Who are some of your literary heroes? I have so many literary heroes, but um, I would definitely say, um, there's so many Latino writers, um, Julia Alvarez, um, the Latino boom era. I love um, people who mix fabulism and uh, genre. So writers like Kelly Link um, and Karen Russell and Amy Bender. 
are sort of my favorites. I also love uh, people who mix fabulism and horror. Um, Carmen Maria Machado and Brian Evanson are so great. And one of the reasons why I love fabulism mixed with horror is uh, the way that they do horror, it's about uncertainty. Like they're looking closely at things that we can never be sure of. And so what is horrifying and uncanny about the world is, is our uncertainty and the way that everything we believe can sort of melt into this shifting ocean. Um, and I, I really appreciate that about, about what they do with their fabulism. Um, but I've got, I have so many books that I love. Very, very cool. Uh, let's see, our next question is from Sierra and it's um, a lot of your stories deal with political themes. Can you speak to how politics and contemporary issues affect your writing? I think it's, it's there was definitely an era where apolitical writing was, was sort of king in workshops. And I think there's definitely, uh, there's so many great stories that are just about relationships, um, but it's still political to be able to look inward. Um, you, if you have the space and the privilege and the, um, the world isn't sort of banging at your door, you can afford to look inward. Um, and I think for me, less and less can I afford to look inward um, with what I see going on around me. And a classic example for this is the school shootings, like very much so hit home because every day I was walking into a classroom where I had to think about, you know, my student over here who's a little unhinged, um, is he gonna bring a gun and is this going to be the day? Um, or, you know, a lot of my students uh, at UCF told me that they knew someone or they were at the Parkland High School um, where there was that school shooting just because they they were sort of close enough that they fed into UCF. Um, anyway, so it's a lot about just the things on my mind and more and more that is politics these days um, for better or worse. But I think one thing that I, I really want to do with my political stories um, and that I think fabulism is a really great, uh, the genre mixing is a really great way of doing it is I don't wanna give a simplified polemic of politics. I don't wanna write a story that's like, this is the right thing to do um, and sort of chastises people for being wrong or ignorant is I always wanna give a story that leaves people with a feeling that they, they got something more complex out of the issue than maybe they went in um, and that these characters are impossible to pin down and that even the worst things that happen can come from love. Um, and I think that often gets not so much lost in the political debate, but we often have to ignore it in the political debate because it's, it's not useful sometimes for change. Um, but when it comes to a story and looking at characters, um, that love that is often behind such harm is, is really interesting to look at. And I think that's what makes the political in my stories come off as more complex and harder to pin down. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, next question is from Kara. What have you been reading lately and loving? Reading and loving lately, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to confess that a lot of my reading lately has been uh, what to expect when you're expecting and <laughs> precious little sleep <laughs> because I have a newborn. Um, but I have been loving a lot of the, sh the recent short story collections that are out. There's um, Kim's collection, Blacklight. There's also a collection called Sabrina and Karina, which I really love um, by uh, Callie Fajardo Anstein. Um, there's also this really gorgeous book, which I have been recommending to everyone called The Devourers by um, Indra Das. And it is a story, it's a werewolf story um, set in India. And it is the most gorgeous, like the language is just beautiful. And it is about um, what it means to have multiple selves and to navigate between that. And it is such a gorgeous story. So I highly recommend that one too. Very good. Uh, another question from Bobby Markey. Um, how do you find inspiration? I would 
say it's everywhere. Um, I think oftentimes I'm in the shower and I'm like, what if this happened? Um, I think it's always it's just, in the shower. I think the shower is. A- <laughs> Yeah, it's always in the shower. Um, So I have a newborn and I've been thinking a lot of um, motherhood stories. um, And it just comes from things that sort of break my heart. I'm like, oh, that should be a story. (laughs) So like while I'm crying, I'm like, I should write a story about this. (laughs) <laughs> so there is I've definitely sobbed a lot in the last few months with this newborn and every time uh we sort of cry together she and I I'm like this is gonna go into a story <laughs> very good um if you could tell your younger writing self anything what would it be I think it would be to just play to write more and to just play. I think when I was a younger writer, I'm very impatient as a person. And I, like everything, was impatient to sort of get this, get a collection done, get the stories out in the world, uh, write the story that did well in workshop, um, revise it quickly. And I think so much of what I've learned, these, these stories took me over, I would say maybe a decade to put into publication. Um, And even though they were published along the way, and some of them sort of did very well right away, as a collection, I had to be very patient. And I had to play a lot before I came to these final stories that ended up really feeling like they were me. Um, And I think the younger version of myself, had they known how long it would take, would have been horrified. Um, But the older, more patient version of myself is so thrilled that I have been able to do what I've done with these stories and meet the editors and the other writers that have sort of inspired me um, and, and definitely matured as a writer. Very good. Um, do you hide secrets in your stories that people who know you may recognize? Probably. Um, it's, it's all comes from life. Um, and it all comes from various heartbreaks I have. In fact, I think every story I can point to a heartbreak that I had um, that sort of was the germination of that story. Uh, though probably they're so remixed and so changed that even if there was something that somebody could be like, oh, I, I, I could see where she sort of got the inspiration from the story. Uh, the characters are different and from real life. Like for example, Thoughts and Prayers, um, We had a wonderful family that lived across the street from us uh, that was Hindu. They might be here, um, but Harry and Shashi, who were, uh, I loved them and they babysat me sometimes. um, And they were also my dad's, my Harry was my dad's boss. um, So they were sort of the inspiration for this family across the street that was Hindu. um, But then everything from there, they also had a daughter. Um, But then I remixed it with, um, there was somebody else who lived across the street who the older sister was a musician and the younger sister was sort of wild in my age. Um, So it's kind of all like mixed together, but obviously the the ending and the characters and all of the flights of fancy are not um, in the end true to life. Okay, gotcha. Um, what What book blew your mind? Is there any, any book that just blew your mind? So many, but lately the devourers, that's the one. Yeah. Check that out. Um, let's see here. What favorite book were you assigned in high school? Do you remember anything that impacted you from high school? No, I am really sad to say that my English classes in high school were uh, Shakespeare motivated. I think we only read Shakespeare and, oh, and then junior year, we read the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I have to say that is why I was not an English major in college. And I ended up being computer science instead. Um, but I ended up reading on my own. My parents would take me to the library. Um, and I just kind of, um, I think it's why I write so genreless now is, there was no librarian telling me like only go into the literary fiction aisle or stick to science fiction and fantasy. It was just kind of here some shelves and here are tons of books and you love books. So just pick all of them. So I'd come (laughs) home with like 15 books of all different genres. Um, And I would say in high school, 
the king must die was one that i really loved um and i also read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and the left hand of darkness was among my favorites then and interestingly i did not love isabel yende's the house of the spirits when it was first given to me um by an aunt um who was like you have to read this and when i first read it i was like huh that's interesting i think it was like 14. and then i read it again in college and i was like wow <laughs> <laughs> funny uh we have another question from Gisela. she wants to know when did you first know you wanted to become a writer so if that is uh if that is Gisela, Gisela? Then, uh, yeah if that then she might have been the one who gave me the house of the spirits um so if that is the right Gisela. um so sorry what was the question again <laughs> um when did hey when did you first know you wanted to become a writer first no that's a good question i when i was young i knew i wanted to be a reader um for life and I often wrote stories thinking like, I'm gonna try my hand at this. And I'd often, you know, when you're young and you think you know everything, I'd often read a book and be like, nah, I don't know, I could write this better. <laughs> no. Um, and then through college, I sort of, I wasn't an English major, but I did take creative writing classes. And I thought maybe I would do tech because um, I was very interested in the way that computer science is a lot like writing a story or world building is when you when you look at sort of the theory of computer science and the philosophy of computer science and when you're creating these worlds um, I mean there's a certain branch of tech that's just code monkeying or just IT but there's another where you're sort of like creating something that feels a lot like writing a story feels to me um, but it wasn't until I worked um, I worked at a tech company for a while and sort of never really found my home there. I found myself thinking if every server in the world went down, a lot of people would care and this would be terrible for the world, but I don't know that I care at this moment enough. Um, whereas with writing, I really care about writing and I care if I keep writing, even though nobody in the world will ever care if, if I write another word again. So I think having that perspective of being like, you know, what, what really matters to me is when I finally was like, okay, I want to be a writer. Okay. And Brenda, I just have a question. Do you, I just like to always hear about process in terms of like, do you have, um, I mean, I have a newborn, so maybe this is different than a normal time, but do you have like a word count that you like to reach at, or do you spend a certain amount of time um, per day or per week that you're writing or do you just kind of, um, how do you, how does your process work? Yeah, that's a good question. Everything has changed now and I don't write uh, for the first two months of this newborn. I have great hopes very shortly that, <laughs> that I'm going to be able to write again. But um, it, uh, it used to be that it was just time. Um, I would, back when I worked jobs, I would say, okay, I have an hour before I have to show up at work. So this is the, the only hour you have. So you better make good use of it. Um, now that um, my time is sort of self-directed, I do word count so that I don't count into my time all of my procrastination. So it's like I have to hit at least 500 words a day or a thousand or 2000, depending on where I'm at in a project. Um, but it has been more or less successful depending on the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no joke. Those newborn, those newborn uh, months are it's no joke, but you're, it will absolutely come back. It does. It just, it just, it takes a while, but it, it, it's always waiting for you. Now I have a question for, um, for actually both of you. Um, what does your writing space look like? Is I'm organized? Is, are you, do you plot it out? Um, your, your stories on cards? I mean, do you have a yeah, for the novel. So for short stories, I, I did it with one story. There's a story called Glow Hunter that I, I remember cutting it up and moving it around. I actually did that with two stories, with foxes too, where I just couldn't sort of see the scale of the story. And so I needed to like actually spread it out on the floor um, of an Airbnb, which is where I was going to escape my children. <laughs> um, and like right now, this is not my writing space. This is my basement. And my kids are literally playing basketball. I should have told them 
don't play basketball on the, it's like right above me. So that's why I keep muting my mic. Um, but I have to hide out from my family down here. And for a long time, they didn't come in the basement because they were scared and that was great. But now they're not scared <laughs> anymore. So they're down here a lot. Um, but it's, I have to be sort of organized. Like my space is organized because it's just procrastination really. It's like everything needs to be perfect before I can begin. Um, but I often write in bed, which is maybe bad for my back, but I just like it. I, so as soon as my family is gone, I like crawl back in bed with my stuff. And then the workspace is kind of for show. I don't know, but um, what about you, Brenda? Yeah, I, I've moved so often. So for the past year, it has been uh, one room in my parents' house. And that has, that was, there was no space to do anything but just the one computer in front of me. Um, but I have before for the novel, um, because of all the different timelines, done a sort of uh, murder mystery board with, with the lines right. connecting the different index cards. Yeah. Um, but I like to outline only because I'm impatient. So I like to like, if I know where I'm going, I have to write it down in an outline and then I can go back and sort of take my time with, with the stuff and the minutia that happens on the way. Gotcha. Okay, the final question, um, this again for, for both of you, what are you working on now? You go first, Brenda. Yeah, well, I've talked about it already, but it's the novel that's called The Furious Branches. Um, and it's this girl who is, uh, she can see all possible futures um, in the middle of the 1965 revolution um, in the Dominican Republic. And the day the Americans invade to sort of quell the revolution, she gets this power and she sees that her mom's going to die in some timelines. So she's sort of trying to figure out how to mastermind all of the pieces of these different people across the city to save her mother. Sounds so good. Um, I'm working on a, I just turned into my editor, a novel called The Boiling River, which my little shorthand logline way of describing it is to just say that it's about Texas motherhood and LSD. Um, but it's just about a, um, a, a woman who's having a hard time dealing with the loss of her sister and her traditional coping mechanisms aren't working anymore. Um, and yeah, I just, it, I've been working on it for a long time and sort of just turned it in. So. Is right. your editor still Margo? No, Mar since so Margo moved. So I'm still at Vintage Knopf. So the book is coming out through Knopf. So I have a different editor. I miss Margo. I love my new editor too. But yeah, um, unfortunately, Margo is, is, I don't get to have her for this book as well. But very good. Well, um, that, that brings us to a close. Um, on behalf of Writer's Block Bookstore, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And special good thanks to our authors for sharing so much and such an inter interesting conversation. Um, don't forget to pick up Brenda's new book, The Rock Eaters, that came out today. Um, and Kimberly's collection, Black Light, both can be ordered through um, Writer's Block Bookstore. I'm sorry, writersblockbookstore.com. Um, and that's it. I want to thank you. Thanks again. And everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thanks. I'm so happy to share The Rock Eaters with you. Thanks so much. Congratulations, Brenda. Thank you, Kim. It's so nice to meet you in person. I have delighted in these stories. So I was thrilled to learn that I was going to have a conversation with you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. I told Margot as soon as I saw her post about this book, I was like, this is extremely my shit. You need to send this to me because I just knew what it was about. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> um, but it's a beautiful book. Congratulations. And I hope that we meet each other in even realer life um, soon enough. So one day, one, one day, day this pandemic will be over. <laughs> I can hope. If not, I'll see you in virtual reality. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.